Well, good morning, Pattonsburg. Uh, thank you for being patient with the weather this week. Uh, I know it's not ideal for us to have to watch a, a Facebook or YouTube stream, but I appreciate all your guys' flexibility with um, just dealing with inclement weather, which we're sure to get more of. Um, I want to open this morning with uh, a psalm. Uh, and if you have your Bibles, you can read along. If not, you can just listen. This is Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Selah. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. I like this one especially for times where we can't meet together in person uh, because it talks about how God's dwelling place, which for us, we tend to think about the church that way, uh, is, is lovely, and it's a place that gives us strength, a place to recuperate, a place to feel safe and rejuvenated. Uh, but we can even have that in our homes or wherever we're watching uh, and listening and praying together uh, through a Facebook or a YouTube stream. So while it's not ideal, it's still possible, and we're thankful for God's presence no matter where we worship. I want to tell you all a story. Um, it's kind of an embarrassing story, actually, for when I was little. I remember one time in my childhood when I got lost, and I don't mean like metaphorically, like I was a black sheep or like a wayward child or something, but like physically actually lost from my parents. See, my old man was a youth minister at this big church out in Colorado. So the youth group activities were pretty sweet compared to some of the stuff that we do in Illinois and Indiana. Um, for example, they would go to a working ranch uh, for summer camp. They would go to a camp up in the mountains for winter camp. And, and this time they took a, a youth group trip to a ski resort uh, so that the students could ski and snowboard for a day. And my brother and my mom, we tagged along with my dad in the youth group because that was one of the most fun things to do was to go along for these activities. And I was in like the first or the second grade probably. I don't really Remember, I was very little. Anyway, my parents wisely decided to put me in a beginner class to learn how to go down the bunny hill on skis. So I went up with this group of people, and mostly adults, right, like grown people and the instructor. And then the little me with my skis and no ski poles is at the top of this hill listening to how to go down the hill, uh, which, you know, to, to put your skis together or pull them apart to go faster or slower, how to turn, how to lean, how not to fall, all that stuff. And they're explaining basically how I could do this without hurting myself. Uh, so eventually, I, I get hyped up enough when I go down the hill. And it was super fun, if I remember right. There wasn't uh, any falling or tripping or anything like that. I just went down the hill, and it was great. But when I got to the bottom, I don't know if I just didn't listen to what I was supposed to do next or if everybody else just knew to get back on the lift and go back up. Uh, but for some reason, I just started wandering around uh, like a fool <laughs> because I didn't recognize anybody at the bottom. It was a bit jarring as a first or second grader to go down this hill by myself and end up in a place where I didn't recognize anybody. And so I did what any wise elementary schooler would do, and I started walking around trying to find my parents or somebody I recognized, and I didn't see any faces that were familiar. I have no idea like what part of the resort my mom is at with my brother. I don't know where my dad's off doing uh, whatever he's snowboarding or skiing. I don't know where anybody is. I don't see anybody I know to ask for help. So here I am, first or second grade, walking around the ski resort, snot dripping out of my nose, cough crying into my scarf because I'm lost and alone. And at some point, a kind adult took notice of me and brought me into a place where a bunch of other kids were eating mac and cheese and watching uh, Prince of Egypt, I think, was what was on the TV. It's weird the things that stick with you. But I, it worked out in the end. My mom found me, and it was all good. But that, that part of like actually being lost, that was terrifying, right? Have you ever been there, lost and alone? <laughs> it's not a fun place to be as a child. Not a fun place to be as an adult, but as a kid especially, away from any authority or safety or security that a parent can, can be there to help protect you and guide you. Being away from that structure is terrifying. 
causes a lot of anxiety in young people getting lost. And getting lost is a very normal human experience to be away from your parents, away from that security. I bring this story up in my own life, one, because it's a little funny that I got lost at a ski resort as like a first or second grader, um, just wandering around. But also because there's a story where a young Jesus, 12 years old, this uh, pre-adolescent boy, uh, he is lost. He seems to be lost. His parents think that they lost track of where he is. This is the story we're going to be reading this morning. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. As we read this story, I want you to pay attention to a few things as we go. First, try and think about Jesus as a regular human, right? A regular 12-year-old boy. All the stuff that adolescents go through. And especially a young kid right on the cusp of early adulthood, of manhood uh, in the Jewish culture. You're, You're beginning to sort through who you are as a member of your family, of your community, as a member of the covenant, starting to really pull more weight around the house or in your parents' business, if that's something you can be a part of. And you're also starting to build up your own personal identity. The beginnings of who you really are are starting to take shape. And that's something that all of us experience too, just like Jesus when he was a boy, figuring out your identity uh, as a member of your family, your community, your faith, and just who you are as a person. So look at how Jesus is just like a regular human in that regard as we read this story. But while you do that, at the same time, I want you to think about Jesus as divine, as God in the flesh, right? A not-so-regular 12-year-old boy, and one who we will see has a pretty good idea of who he is and what he's going to do, his purpose, his authority, his direction, his mission on this earth, because he's not quite like all the other 12-year-old boys. So pay attention to how Jesus is just like a regular human, and also how Jesus is completely unlike a regular human in this story. So let's start to read it. This is Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 40. And pay attention to the first line. Always pay attention to the first line, because it sets the tone what this entire story is going to be about. Verse 40. The child, talking about Jesus here, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. It's important. Verse 41. Now every year his parents, Mary and Joseph, went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. (laughs) So just like you and me, Jesus gets dragged along for the holidays with his family. I'm joking a little bit. We find out that Jesus took this kind of piety, this religious observance, very seriously Uh, of his own accord, not just what his parents wanted. But it is kind of funny to think of a young Jesus being pulled along as a toddler, as a young young kid, uh, pulled along through these family traditions, these family holidays, these things that they do every year. And to think about that, this this annual pilgrimage for Mary and Joseph and their family and Jesus uh, would have traditions probably with it, things that they would do on the road as they traveled to pass the time, uh, things that they would do the food that they would eat uh, to celebrate Passover, all the same kind of things that families have always done. Jesus, as a very regular human being, part of a family, participating in the kinds of traditions that families participate in. And here's your piece of free Bible reading trivia for the day. Notice how when people go to Jerusalem, whether they come from the north, the south, the east, or the west, they are always going up, always up to the temple, to God's dwelling place. Back to the story, we see here a very young Jesus, a very human Jesus, traveling with his family to celebrate Passover, to participate in the traditions that his parents found important, and that we'll find out Jesus found important too. So Jesus, like some of us, he's part of a religious family, and like all of us, he's part of a family with traditions, and they celebrate the holidays with traditions and travel. So let's keep reading about pre-adolescent young boy Jesus and what happens on this specific Passover trip on his 12th Passover trip. Verse 43, when the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a whole day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and among their friends. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. 
Did you catch how Jesus was the one who actively decided to stay behind in Jerusalem? He wasn't left behind. He wasn't lost. He decided to camp out in Jerusalem. He wanted to stay there even after the festival was over. This was an intentional decision on his part. But his parents don't pick up on this, right? They assume he's 12. He's probably old enough. He's just with some of our friends in this traveling group. He's with the cousins. He's with, you know, the people that are from his neighborhood, walking with them, traveling with them. And they assume that he's part of the crew. And it's only when they finally start to set up camp for the night on the road that they realize, oh, man, where's Jesus? <laughs> like He's not in the tent. He's not here for dinner. Where did he go? They start to ask around, right, asking the relatives and the friends if they've heard anything or seen anything, uh, if they've seen Jesus at all today. And when they find out that no one knows where he is, they book it back to Jerusalem to try and find their son. I mean, this has to be terrifying as parents, right? Thinking you've left your son behind in a city. And it's not like it is today, right, with cell phones or even pay phones or people who will try to help your kid if they're alone even. There's no police departments, no social workers, none of that stuff. Your kid is on their own if they get left somewhere. This 12-year-old boy is lost in their eyes. This kid is on his own in the city with no one to look out for him, no authority to protect him, no security to take care of him, nobody to help him because they left him behind. And they can't do anything about it besides walk back and try and find him. Now, I've never been in that situation as a parent or a babysitter or anything like that, but I cannot imagine how horrible Mary and Joseph must have felt in this moment. So they go to try and find him. In verse 46, after three days, after three days of searching, they found him. And they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions, and all who heard Jesus were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Three days. Imagine looking all over a city for three days trying to find your lost boy. And they finally find him in the last place they look, in the temple. And he's not just waiting around, right? He's doing work. He's doing the same work that he's going to do throughout the entire Gospel of Luke. Jesus is found with the teachers, Listening to their instruction, listening to their questions, answering their questions, asking his own questions, going back and forth, amazing everybody who listens. And this 12-year-old boy, Jesus, astonishes his parents and the teachers with how wise, did you hear that? And how knowledgeable his answers are. Just like the first line of the story. Remember at the beginning, verse 40, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And that's proven in his interactions with the teachers in the temple. But Mary and Joseph do what parents do. They're a little upset. And in verse 48, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And Mary, his mother, said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Jesus said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? <laughs> but they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. So when they find the boy Jesus, Mary and Joseph, after searching for three days, this wunderkind teaching the teachers, their response they don't understand. They're upset. Jesus scared them. They thought that they had lost him in this city all by himself. This boy, this very normal boy in their eyes, left alone in the big city with no one to look out for him. And they are reasonably upset that he would make a decision like that. They say, how could you do this to us? We thought you were lost, but you chose to stay behind even after the festival. See, they don't understand. They understand Jesus the boy, Jesus their son, Jesus the human, but they don't understand Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the divine, Jesus God in the flesh. Until he points out to them that he would of course be in his father's house. His father, God, not Joseph. While, they, while Mary and Joseph easily understand Jesus is fully human, 
and respond to his being lost, quote unquote, just like a regular boy, they don't immediately understand Jesus' divine purpose, his divine authority, and his divine identity. I mean, look at who is speaking and who is listening in this story. The teachers, the scribes, the temple authorities are the ones who are amazed at Jesus. He possesses a wisdom deeper than any other 12-year-old boy they've ever seen, and probably more than any other adult they've ever seen. He wields knowledge and authority from a young age, and he does this in such a way as to amaze everyone who sees it. But Mary and Joseph, they don't pick up on it right away, because he was a 12-year-old boy in their eyes, just like the rest of them. Probably ornery. (laughs) Probably a little mischievous. I mean, enough that he would choose to stay behind and freak his parents out. But he was a 12-year-old boy, right? The same pressures, the same changes, the same experiences that all of us have felt as we entered into adolescence. But his identity, his real identity, as the Son of God, as God in the flesh, and his purpose on this earth to lead a ministry, to teach, to release the captives, to proclaim sight for the blind, all these things that we read about when he stands up in synagogue, Jesus' true purpose and his true identity, his parents don't quite pick up on that right away. Because he was a 12-year-old boy, just like the rest of them. But also completely unlike the rest of them. And did you hear that last line at the end of the story? It's the same one as the opening. Jesus, getting older, growing in wisdom and in years, in divine and human favor. Mary and Joseph didn't get it right away. Do we? <laughs> See, what do we do with this story from Jesus' childhood? Man, I personally, I love this one. I think this is such a great story for us to wrestle with. To wrestle with one of the biggest mysteries <clears throat> and contradictions of our faith, that the Son of God, Jesus, is fully human and fully God. Fully flesh fully divine at the same time. And this childhood story from Luke is really set up to get us to start to think this way, right? From the beginning, Jesus is growing in divine and human favor as he becomes a man. And at the very end, the same thing, growing in divine and human favor. So we see a childhood story like this where Jesus experiences the same stuff as any other 12-year-old boy, seemingly getting left behind by his parents, lost, a very normal human experience, something that any regular kid would experience at one point or another. But it results in something so much more impressive, something that's indicative of his divine authority and his divine identity. The Son of God, Jesus, is fully human and fully God. And this dual identity is affirmed even more at his baptism in the next chapter of Luke when he goes out to meet John the Baptist in the wilderness. This is Luke 3.21. When all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And hear this. A voice came from heaven, saying, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The same stuff we see in this boyhood story of Jesus getting quote-unquote lost and left at the temple, but demonstrating something about who he is, what he knows, what he's going to do, we see come up again in this baptism. When the heaven opens up, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, and God cries out from up there that this one, This one is my son, my beloved, and with him I am well pleased. Who else would deserve authority? Who else would we listen to but that guy? So friends, as we read the Gospels together and on our own, let us all work to see the humanity in Jesus. Jesus fully human, experiencing the same things that you and I experience, the same feelings, the same thoughts, the need to eat, the need to sleep, the same pain, the same hurt, the same excitement, the same joy, all those things that make us human, Jesus experiencing that completely. But at the same time, let us also work to see the divinity in Jesus, the wisdom beyond anything we could ever access, the ability to work miracles that we could only scratch the surface of replicating, fully divine 
God himself in the flesh with us and among us. As you read scripture, and especially the gospel, stories about who Jesus is and what he's doing, pay attention. Pay attention to how he's fully human and how he's fully divine. Would you pray with me as we close out our online service this Sunday? Lord, we thank you for your son, uh, your son, one of us, you, one of us, in the flesh, fully human, experiencing everything we experience, that you know the struggles we have, you know the feelings we have, the temptations we have, you know everything we go through as people. But God, we thank you that the only one who had the authority, the only one who was qualified to bridge that gap between us and you, Jesus, was fully divine. And as we read scripture and wrestle with this truth, as we try and understand this, this uh, conundrum, this contradiction of fully divine, fully human, may we see it all the more clearly every time we encounter stories about Jesus, every time we tell stories about Jesus. God, help us to see a fuller picture of our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.